So ikigai is a Japanese word, which means uh, roughly the purpose in your purpose in life, or what is the what is that thing that is worthwhile doing for you, and what that you are looking forward to do when you wake up in the morning, and you are looking forward to your day. You wake up in the morning and you jump from the bed, and yes, this is going to be an amazing day because of this that this thing that's that's your ikigai hi i'm brilliant your host for this show i know that i'm incredibly blessed as the son of self-made billionaires i've seen the high price some people pay for success and i've learned that money really can't buy happiness but i've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers i created this podcast and the school for good living to share what i've learned and to keep exploring the question, what does it mean to live a good life and how can we do it? Despite my privilege, I lived for decades in a pretty dark place, and I know that living is often a painful, difficult, and messy business. But I also know that it can be wonderful beyond imagination and that it's a skill at which we can improve. That's why every episode is a conversation with an author who's an expert regarding spirituality, health, relationships, work, rest, and play, or money. I also ask my guests about their creative habits, routines, and mindsets, and what they've done to get their books written, published, and read. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. If you are interested in living a long and happy life, this interview is for you. It's a conversation I have with Hector Garcia, who wrote, along with his co-author, Francescus Morales, the book Ikigai, the Japanese secret to a long and happy life. I have lived in Japan. I love the country. I love the culture. I love the language. I've learned so much from being there. And that's part of why I love Hector's writing. He takes some very Japanese concepts, many of which, unless you have also lived there or you have studied it, you probably have never been exposed to, combines those with other Eastern thoughts, Western philosophy, practical philosophy, I might say, and he has, that explains why, by the way, that explains perhaps why this book has sold more than 2 million copies and has been translated into at least 58 languages. It's the most translated book that was ever originally written in Spanish. It's kind of a unique distinction. Hector is a very thoughtful guy. His other books include the book of Ichigo Ichie, The Art of Making the Most of Every Moment, The Japanese Way. And last year, which is 2020, he published Forest Bathing, the Rejuvenating Practice of Shinrin Yoku. This year, he will in 2021, he will publish Ikigai for Teens, Finding Your Reason for Being, something I wish someone had taught me when I was a teen. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Hector Garcia. Hector, welcome to the School for Good Living. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Will you tell me, please, what's life about? I don't know, but today I'm going to say to you that I feel like it's about uh, discovering what is all this about. So it's about discovering the what's this universe about, and also about another component that's 50%, I think, and the other 50% is discovering what we ourselves are about, which sounds both, uh, I think, it are very difficult, knowing what's uh, everything about and knowing what you are about. And the key about this discovery process is that I think that's another one of the keys in life is like, is not only you don't have to get stressed with this discovery process and the most important thing to do and what life is about is uh, about having fun in this process, whatever it happens. Beautiful. Which sounds very easy to say, but as humans, we all tend to like have this thing that the in Asia called like suffering. It's not really suffering, but suffering in life, which uh, it's. I th I'm thinking it's inevitable, but there are th ways which we can navigate life easier. And having this mindset of okay, I'm just here discovering what is this is about, and yeah. I have to let's have fun. Beautiful. Okay. So if I ask you this first big question about what life's about, and then that other fifty percent that you mentioned about discovering ourselves, what have you discovered about yourself? Who are you? What is your work? 
How do you describe yourself? Okay, that's that's even more <laughs> difficult than the previous one. I realized that, so one, I, I think like everyone, I've been having many phases in my life where you realize things about yourself and you notice that it's not at some point, you, you are having phases in life, you are having more self-awareness. Uh, so when you are three years old, you are not very aware. You like you are even a human being. You even like there's some people who have memories from really really childhood, but it's rare. And then when you are five years old, ten years old, you are fifteen, you are realizing more things. You you are very confused about the world. You start having like many crazy emotions. We develop uh, like sexuality. You are in your twenties and you are thrown into the world and you are not you're supposed to be an adult through the process you can be mindlessly sometimes you get i see it as it is extremely difficult to to know who you are by just asking uh, asking yourself who i am who i am which this is also one technique but this is one of those the hardest you can read books about buddhist and and meditation, and there's all these techniques. That's one path, and that's okay. But I think for the rest of us, you can use that too, like as one. The rest of us, I think it's very important. A friend, I, it might sound like a cliche, but friends and family, and observing what's going around you, but because that's, that can give you lots of clues about who you are. So the way your friends are treating you, the way you are behaving and start noticing how you're behaving if you are starting in a new job, like what type of role you are taking. And that might you might see patterns in your life when you were a kid and when you were working in a company or when you were working in an association. Maybe you have a tendency to always be the leader or be the person who is sitting there thinking. You have these tendencies. And in myself, now going back to the question, I've noticed that some some things I have some tendencies which are interesting because I did I'm I'm noticing them through time. And, and I like my technique. I've tried all kinds of things these days, like by reading books and by people, like I've tried like uh, meditation, thinking by myself, asking friends. And for me the best way is writing in a diary. I've been doing that since I was, I think since I was 10 years old, I've been writing a diary. Wow. Is this daily, every single day? Or? I, I wouldn't say, I, I don't write, I haven't written every day since I'm 10 years old, mm -hmm. but I would say that every year I've written some kind of diary, at least, I don't know, 100 days each year. Is is something I I tend to write in my diary when I when I'm having a either a very good day or a very bad day. <laughs> <laughs> no. If I'm having normal days, maybe there are 15 days that I don't write a diary, and then if there is a super a beautiful day, then and then by reading myself, I discover okay, this is how I was. This is these are the things I was worried or about like 10 years ago, or I thought were important. Uh, you realize that some things repeat and some others disappear from your worries. And for me, what I've this like I've noticed that I have this when I'm around people, I'm always like the kinds now because you are asking. I'm in an interview, so this is very easy for me. So I have to talk, but I'm usually the quiet one when I'm in a group in the, uh, of people. So I have like yeah, that's one of my tendencies. Another one is that I'm very, I get very curious about everything, which this can be a good thing or a bad thing. I can get into whatever. If you, if you brilliant, brilliant, you you inspire me. But I didn't ask you how to pronounce your name. But if you inspire me to do something, and you convince me a lot, like you might put me into a a new kind of. I get obsessed with things, so that's another one. What's something that you've been obsessed with lately? Uh, lately, this is going to sound weird, but I'm going back to maybe we can go. I'm going back to one of the things I've left. I'm from the generation I was born at the beginning of the 80s, and I am the, the generation that I I was brought up like playing the first video games, 
that were cool, I think, Nintendo, Super Mario. Oh, yeah, like the 8-bit like system. Yes. So Zelda, Duck Hunt, and Mario. I was, I'm going to be... Yes, yes. So, And one of my dreams has been always like, I want to create a video game. So I also have this tendency of, I like creating things. Mm-hmm. And I've used that to, until now, I've been very focused on writing. And that's another one of my, I, I like writing. It helps my souls for some some reason. Like put, I put things in order, like I need to write things. And that's my creative pursuit. But sometime in the future, I want to create a video game because I think it combines elements these days. You can, it's almost like a movie. You can tell a story. It's like an interactive. So I'm thinking like an interactive novel or something like that and make it into a video game. But yeah, I don't know. At at the moment, it's an obsession. Okay. So what I'm taking away so far, and you can add to or correct by all means, but we've got writer. So we know you're you're a writer from the age of 10. We also know that you are uh, a photographer You've got a beautiful Instagram feed uh, where you yeah, take yes, the photos. That's another thing that I got very, very obsessed, and I think I I think that that was Japan. In Japanese, there are many many amazing photographers in Tokyo, so that got me into photography, which it's I think is an artistic. It helped my. I'm very like I, I was trained as an engineer, so it's very like one, two, three. And photography is something that you can use. I recommend for anyone who is like an engineer or very, because you can use cameras also as a very techy device. But the, when you have to shoot the photo, you have to use an other parts of your brain, which I think that's that's very, yeah. And it's not important. I've seen amazing photographers taking with the crappiest camera, you can take the most amazing pictures. It's not, yeah. it's not the camera. Yeah, that's right. These days, the phone or the camera does just about all the hard work if you want it to. Yes, yes. But, that's the... but, but still, so we've got writer, we've got photographer, we've got video game designer in the making. Uh, yes, that's a lot of pressure now. <laughs> <laughs> aspiring. Your, aspiring. Your online bio yes. says aspiring philosopher, but I think you uh, could dispense yes. with aspiring. I think philosopher... Boom! Mission accomplished. Uh, I have to. I think maybe my brother, my brother probably will listen to this podcast. I have to blame my brother for that one. <laughs> I was not writing. I wrote first in my not as I, I wrote philosopher, but my brother said that was too much. They're like aspiring, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> okay. it's like I can and I think he's right. My brother, to be fair, I think for me, philosopher is a very to become a true philosopher, in my mind, is like this. But but it, the, the definition of philosopher is very interesting. It's just yeah, you have like you are a lover, a lover of, wisdom. of wisdom, right? Yeah, which you are. So that was my argument with my brother. I said, okay, I I love wisdom. That's the definition of philosopher. Therefore, I am a philosopher. But then when I think about the greatest philosophers in history. Is like, and I want it sounds like if I put philosopher, it's like I'm comparing anyway. We had this, but yeah, I'm, I'm asp- aspiring to become a better thinker about like have more clear thoughts about, and I guess this is also one of your missions with, with this podcast have clear thoughts about what is all this about. Yep, so yeah, and sense, what it means to live a good life. Uh, yeah, we are all aspiring, aspiring to become to become like one percent more aware of all these things. Yes, yeah, and as part of why I love your writing, I've I read Ikigai, the Japanese secret to a long and happy life, which I know you wrote a few years ago. But congratulations on this book for a couple reasons. I understand this is the most translated book ever written originally in Spanish, which is a unusual distinction but a pretty cool one yes it is very i'm still i don't know what to make (laughs) of it i think it's it's thanks to the internet because we've like there's many many it's an interesting area there are many many publishers in many like countries that you don't know even know about i've been learning about 
world geography that they just contact me through Instagram and then, okay, I want to publish the book here. And I think this couldn't happen like 30 years ago. Like if a book I write originally in a Spanish language. So 30 years ago, it was much more difficult. Maybe a book in Spain would never get out. So it, I think it's an amazing time to... So yes, it's like the Spanish written in Spanish is the most translated ever. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that this book has gone on to sell more than 2 million copies. It's been a bestseller in India <laughs> for the last few months, I understand, which is pretty cool. Uh, now, yeah, well, now the latest news is I it, it's, it has been the most sold book in India in 2020. That's Offici amazing. We've got the official about which when I think about it, it's also weird. It's above everything. It's like yeah. more more than I always use Harry Potter. It's more than it seems Harry Potter is not even popular in India. So that's amazing. Like well there's a lot of I think with that book there's a lot of cultural things that probably don't cross over. But the yes, thing Yes, but I don't maybe this is a question uh, why do you think you, you also have been traveling and living all around the world. Why do you think Indians because from those Two million copies that you say, like half of the half of it is in India, like a million a million copies. Why do you think that Ikigai resonates so much with Indian culture? Is something I've been asking now to all my Indian friends, and no one gives me a, an answer. It's very yeah. well, mysterious. That, it is an interesting question, and I think part of what it points to is the universality of the message, right? And so that's one thing, but. As we know, you know, that India with a rich spiritual tradition is what the way I see it, at least, is curious and inclusive. It's not like, hey, we have the truth and everyone else is wrong. So we're not going to read what what people outside of our borders have to say. But instead, there's this thirst for knowledge and spirituality. And I think your book does such a unique thing of combining Eastern thought with Western philosophy, that it's something new. I don't, at least I'm not familiar with other books that quite strike that chord. And I don't know that that's the answer, but. That's true. I think that's, this is one of the best answers I've been given. That's okay. So the Indian, yeah, the Indian are very, they are very open. They're almost, they, but they are very, sometimes they are, seem like very childlike and hey, hey, hey. But that makes them a culture that it's like absorbing information from everyone. Yeah, uh, I, I think so. Because so like in my observation of the Indian culture, science, see in, in the West, or at least in the United States, in my view, we put spirituality on one end of a spectrum and science on the other. And we almost see them as opposites. Whereas in India, they do see them as distinct things, but instead of being on either end, they're right next to each other. So this kind of view of saying, look, science and spirituality in some ways are companions. They're not opposites. And I, it doesn't surprise me then that if that's true, that that's the, the worldview in that culture, that they would adopt uh, yes. a book or just be really interested in a book like Ikigai. That's the rationality, you know, the logical, but also the intuitive and the, in some ways the spiritual. Yes, India is like I'm. In fact, this is another one of my interests lately. I'm reading books about India, Indian culture, because I realized I didn't know anything about them. So yeah, that, this is that was another one of my obsessions lately. What are you reading about India now? Do you recall the titles? Uh, no, sorry, I'm very bad yeah. with titles. No, I know people. I know They're readers not, often don't know the title because it's like, hey, it's just in my ebook. <laughs> it's whatever I found, uh, yes, you know. That's, so. I get that. Let me ask you this while we're speaking. This model that's on the back of the book, I understand you attribute this to someone, but I'm curious if you can. I know sometimes even the things that we talk about or we base a work on are not always the easiest to articulate succinctly, but will you tell me what is this model? Where did it come from? And why is it so darn resonant with so people? It's that that why it's so resonant. I don't know, but it is. It's a kind of amazing how resonant it is. And this was so yes, as as this was originally. There are many versions of these uh, circles, and that come like I, I've never got into that. You could even do a 
I researched and got deep into these circles where they came from. And there was there was a version that it was three bubbles, and I forgot if that one was without the money one or with, with the money one that was made by the, he's also a very famous Ken Robinson he has TED Talks and many books oh yeah books. the Englishman and the, he talks about the the element yep and if you think about the element it's very similar to the concept You, it's slightly different but it's like you are being in your element you are being in a, like okay we, you are in your element you are like almost you feel like you are thriving through life every day is like amazing and you're looking forward for to the next day that's the you're in your element and if you're not in your element you're very stressed and unhappy and that's kind of similar to ikigai ikigai is more like i see it as like a purpose in life and then yeah this could be a long the, the thing is like then on the internet people start, started changing these bubbles and there is this person who is called his Mark Wynn, which uh, he put in his blog, he put the word Ikigai in the center. So he's the one that I attribute in the book because I think he's the original. And I sent him the inter- this we have this story. I sent him an email before writing the book, which the book was, by the way, we wrote it in 2015. So it's been a long while. And it's the first book about Ikigai that was written. So and now there are like dozens and dozens. Yeah. And, and, and let me just I'd, jump in right there, if I may. Don't lose your thought on, on where we were. But let's share for the listener, anybody who doesn't know, what is Ikigai? What does the term even mean? Uh, ikigai. So Ikigai is a Japanese word, which means uh, roughly the purpose in your purpose in life. Or what is the what is that thing that is worthwhile doing for you, and what that you are looking forward to do when you wake up in the morning, and you are looking forward to your day. You wake up in the morning and you jump from the bed, and yes, this is going to be an amazing day because of this, that this thing that that's your ikigai. If you are not waking up like that, then, then, then that means there is. It's not bad, but it could be. We can go there later into dark. You it, you can be in a dark place in your life. Yeah. yeah, I think if if it happens one or two days per week, that's okay. That's very human. But if you are waking up every morning and you don't feel your achy guy for every day for months, that that's very dangerous. That's why I think the achy guy word condenses lots of meaning. And the first time I heard about this word in Japanese, like I was learning Japanese, like I started when I arrived here. Like 20 years ago. I always stayed in my mind, the word ikigai. It's like, okay, this is an important... It's, and I always had the thought that everyone in the world should know this word, like geisha or katana or something like that. Karate. And... Karaoke. Yes, karate, <laughs> karaoke, ikigai. So ikigai is, and ikigai is very easy to use. It's like if you have a friend who is needs help, it's like you can ask them what what's your ikigai, or you should think more about your ikigai than than this worry that you're having these days. So yeah. So you read this blog yeah, with Mark Wynn, who's written um, ikigai in the center of these circles. Yes, and and I was already thinking about the word ikigai for a long time. <laughs> And then, and and yeah. So to finish the story about the circles, like, and Mark Wynn never, never answered me. I guess he was busy in those days. But an amazing thing happened two months ago. He sent me, he found me on Twitter, and we connected over Zoom, and we had a blast. Like uh, he's living in an island now, and he's very he's living his icky guy much more than me. Well, I hope so. If the dude wrote a blog, like the original post about this yeah, thing. <laughs> yes, and he's he was telling me, I'm going to paraphrase maybe if Mark is listening. So I'm, I'm infinitely grateful because I'm aware that this is one of the keys of, we, we used, it was creative commons. We can use, I and I always, you can use those circles. It's like, and I think Mark Wynn told me that it's one, he took him 15 minutes. He just put the word Ikigai and that became famous on the internet and 
and then people like me wrote books and everything and i think i think now it's evolving there are many there's people who are putting eight circles and everything but i think the key is what you said that the one with the four circles is very is the one that resonates most with everyone right and the four circles what you love what the world needs what you can get paid for and what you're good at right so i realize people are listening yes resonates with people yeah and so for people listening who aren't necessarily seeing that getting the idea that these four circles overlap and in the center of that where the overlap is you can hit two or three and that's great you can find your passion you can live your mission find your vocation or profession but it's there's something special that happens when you're in the dead center right they're right in the middle of all four of them and that's the ikigai yes and you can see them you can see them as buckets and you so i think it resonates with people because when you see that it usually it becomes a mirror of yourself because you will find it's very difficult to have this if you visualize each of the circles like buckets like how feel are in your life you might be very happy with uh, your money but you are doing things that you don't love every day you're doing things that you hate or the reverse you are like uh, we all have these uh, friends who are very obsessed with their art but they are not even focused on marketing their art and they're not making any money then there is the circle about what the world needs that this can feel overwhelming but i always it's not like you have to help the whole world you can change the words the words and focus on is what the what the universe or the people around it from you so it can be as easy as as sitting down with a friend who needs you and spending half an hour listening to them that's something that the world needs it's not like you have to be like bill gates and donate to everyone because i believe this is like i believe in like you can call it the butterfly effect if you every day you say th- nice things and you do this a lot you say thank you a lot i think that's very powerful because that's the world what the world needs that has a that will make me feel good because you said many and then because i feel good that will have effects i will start saying more the thank you to everyone around me like maybe today or tomorrow so that's very powerful what the world needs is not only like don't feel overwhelmed so balancing these circles i think it's very difficult and that's usually when everything is in balance is when you are feeling more like you are with your purpose in life with your ikigai is working Awesome. So what, in your experience, in your research, in your just observation, what is the biggest impediment to people living their ikigai, to finding and living it? Okay. That's another difficult, the biggest. I I think there are many. I think that the most, I think that the, the most common, this has been also like talking, I've been talking, I've been in Zoom calls with thousands of indians last year me and and my co-author francesc and one of the so in india and i think this is true for everyone like it sounds very like at the end of the day and it is without feeling like in our like there is always a struggle of like there are restrictions in life so you see these circles and say okay hector that's very nice but but I want to, my ikigai is uh, playing the guitar, but I can only make a uh, hundred dollars playing my local bar here in my Indian city. And I have to do my, I have to struggle doing my job because I have a family with, there are all these restrictions, right? And I think the the most difficult thing for everyone is to balance and the more when you come to the, an adult life, these restrictions can start overwhelming us. I, I don't know. I think it's not a good word, restrictions, but things start uh, like like layering out. You 
And I'm going to put the typical examples. You get married, you have kids, then this happens, then this happens, then maybe you lose a loved one, and then maybe you end up in a bad place in a company that you at the beginning you were happy, but they moved you to a weird department. You've got a mortgage. You have a mortgage, and now you have a bad boss that hates you, and you hate your boss. And then like all these things, and this can be, this is like the worst example, but as a micro example, you can also get your life now. And I'm sure there are these little things that are kind of like, okay, this is, I would love my Ikigai would be, I don't know, traveling around the world and writing books and blah, blah, blah. But there are these things that I have, to, you have to deal with. Right. So I think that's the most difficult thing that people find. and. The, I think the key is that, that that's okay. That's that happens to everyone. It's like we we always think. I think one of the worst things is like you, you always think, oh, because this guy is successful because this. I always say like I think this say we have this say in Spain is like, or maybe you have it in English too that, the garden from your neighbor always looks more green. Yeah, we say the grass is always greener. Oh, on the okay, other side a, of the fence. So I think that's very. I like that a lot because <laughs> yeah. probably maybe you you think he, but if you put yourself in the life of that person, it be, it would be even worse. So I really believe in something like slowing down and appreciating all the good things that we have. Start changing, shifting your perspective, maybe. Maybe your boss is not as bad as you think. If you shift your perspective, maybe things change a little bit. You can start looking for an alternative. You can start playing with those restrictions that are appearing in your life. And to start changing changing your life and moving forward to a better path, the bad things happen when we get stagnated. We get so stressed with everything that is happening in our life, we, we stop and then that's that's when things can go wrong so i think that's if you want to i think that's one of the most struggle with an ikigai and life in general is an ikigai in your in your understanding is does our ikigai change or is it is it one thing does it evolve is it do we just find different forms to express it like because it sounds so clean to go hey just find your ikigai and you wake up every day and you'll uh, yeah, be excited no, no. right <laughs> so i disagree with that i think another <laughs> yeah i think it changed like another one of the keys of how we wrote the book is we didn't want to and i think this is might be one of the reasons why it's popular the book we didn't want to put the definition a very clear it's open on purpose because we realize that the way that's also depending on the person and the culture, uh, the way people see purpose and ikigai in general is very different. There is always this thing: purpose is discover, on, or you create your purpose. So, is do you discover your ikigai and then you are happy forever, or do you create your ikigai by struggling? And I think my so we don't. My personal opinion, but this is not written in the book, is that you have to create your ikigai. But I'm also okay with people who believe that is you have to discover it. It's somewhere. I'm okay with that as long as you you do steps to discovering it, because at the end of the day, the end result will be the same. You will be more connected with things that you enjoy and you are helping people around you, and the end result is like you and people around you will be happier. So what you believe about these things is is not that important. The important thing is that you are heading to you keep it in mind. You you don't lose, you don't end up. I see the exact opposite of ikigai will be like so if you can have you can have this vision of 100 percent ikigai in your life. Or 100% nihilism, so we zero, and 100% nihilism is very dangerous because it's basically it's like, uh, like it's basically suicide. There is no meaning. It's like zero meaning in your life, and that's very very dangerous. Like people underestimate how dangerous can the 
that be. I lived so, in that place uh, for a long uh, time. So that maybe you can say like that's very you, you know how it is, and it's it's not easy to, to going back to the previous question. It is very difficult to move the needle, like to get out. That's the most difficult thing. But in the moment you are aware that this this is there, and getting out of there is the difficult. Even if you're aware of it, it's like, ah, yeah, nice, you're telling me, but but at least keep it in mind. And yeah, your ikigai can change. In fact, this also, there is some research I've been reading that in fact, like most, like 80% or 90% of the people, when you become an adult and you start in like having a job and everything, like more than 80% of the people when you retire or like you become your 60s, you are doing something totally different from what you started. Only 20%, which that 20%, by the way, I think it's also very necessary. It's usually like dentists, lawyers, surgeons, like like people who society needs, but that's one type of personality. And then there is also this 1%, which they have their, they are five years old, they start playing the piano, and they are 90 years old and they keep playing the piano. And this can be also like a famous painters. Yeah. That's also amazing. I always think of Justin Bieber with this example. Yes, that's that's amazing. And these people exist in the world. But uh, as we said before, it's like the, the green, the grass, like grass is not like having the, uh, admiring this type of people is amazing. I, I admire these people, but being aware that you are not like most of the rest of the people we are not like that yeah and it's okay and and it's okay that's the other thing and for the rest of the people i think your ikigai is shifting and i think one of the keys is to to realize when 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 your ikigai is changing you don't keep doing things if you are now 35 years old and you became a mother and a father uh, maybe your ikigai should be to focus on your family for 20 years and you should stop like like behaving like you are 25 years old and, and single <laughs> in, yeah, yes right, yeah. so in those periods of transition is when i think there is the most pain and i see it in friends it's like there is a hard transition in life and when you see it in a friend it's very easy it's like your friend keeps doing things like five years ago but their life is in another step. Like, please move on. And and when when it's in ourselves, we are more like blind. It's like we <laughs> yes. keep doing the same things, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. Some I love something you talk about in this book about compasses, not maps. And I wonder if this has any bearing on what we're talking about now about evolving, allowing our ikigai to evolve or change as we go through these phases and transitions in life that we inevitably all do. Yes, so I see, I use, so this is another thing that is a little bit open in the book. You Uh can see Kigai like as this one thing or like a play, uh, but for me, for myself, I see it as a compass that is heading somewhere. And I more or less know, like you can, you can, be like a very special person and you know exactly where your compass is pointing. It's pointing to you can like to this exact place and you start doing that every day. For me now, these days my ikigai is very focused. My compass is into writing the best I can so I can inspire people all around the world. So that's my compass is heading there. But as I said, before my personality has these tendencies that I get obsessed with other things. So I'm exploring within that area. The only thing I'm not doing is the reverse. Like your, your ikigai is pointing here, here, but you are lost in circles doing something with that. You can use the word procrastination. You should, you say you want to be, you, you want to do this and this and this, and you are telling your friends, but then you go home and you're not doing those things. So, I see it as a compass that is pointing somewhere and that compass can start shifting through life, pointing to other places. And knowing where that compass is pointing, it can be very difficult. For people listening, one very easy 
if you have time, you can do you can get the four circles. You don't even need the book. You can you can Google the for the Ikigai four circles. And a very powerful thing is not just to listen to this podcast or think about it, but write it down what you are good at, what you love doing, uh, what the world needs from you. Like we said before, like maybe you are good with words or whatever, like people around you, maybe your your father, your mom needs you these days and you're ignoring them. You write down and the the word like the money one how and I like thinking about the money one. You can write how you're making money now, but you can also write down how you could make money in other ways. Like these days there are many ways like maybe you like this is especially good for artists. Or if you if you're lucky enough that you have enough money, how you can use that money to help the the circle of what the world needs, like how you can, and also to to leverage your ikigai. So if you are lucky enough to have enough money, and then the key, if you have time to write down these things, that's amazing. If not, the last step of the ex- exercise, if you have to, I call it the ikigai declaration, like. You write down a full sentence. After thinking about these four circles, like it, it usually comes naturally. And you start the sentence, my ikigai is dot dot, and then you write the full sentence. So I'm going to give you an example of a bad ikigai declaration for myself. It would be, my ikigai is writing. So this is a bad ikigai declaration. It's it's a good starting point, but in the sentence I'm not including what the world needs. I'm not including the money. If I'm just writing my diary for all my life and I'm not sharing it with the world, it's a very it's just an egoistic thing for myself. So a better ikigai is uh, my, my ikigai is is writing the best I can while enjoying it and writing the best words I can so people around the world will be inspired by my words. And as a consequence, I will I will have enough money to have a living. So this is very long, and you can make your own version, like putting together all the pieces. What I love about that is that it starts to provide some real clarity Right, and even yes. if it's it's vague, I mean, to start somewhere by and the power of making a declaration. Yes, and you and you write it down because I realize I've never, in fact, I've never written. I wrote the book Ikigai, but I had never done this exercise myself. So I've never in my life written down what my the purpose of my life is, and I think most of the listener, maybe I'm wrong, like maybe you have amazing listeners. We have we are going through life without writing down what is our life about. Yeah. So just get some time and write it down, and then you will have a better guess of where your compass is is heading. If you want to visualize it, visualize it as a compass. So. No, that's awesome. And the thing too that you write in this book about our intuition and our you say. Our intuition and curiosity are very powerful internal compasses to help us connect with our ikigai. Mm, So I love that about trusting, you know, listening, slowing down, noticing, paying attention to our intuition and our curiosity. Something else I want to ask you about, about what makes this challenging for people to find that clarity. I want to ask you about this term kaika, which you write is sometimes the most difficult part, setting aside other people's demands to make room for our passion, allowing the reasons we feel we were put on the earth to begin to blossom. But I so I've just written <laughs> a sentence from your book, but what is kaika? How do you understand that? Kaika, this is another, it's like we, we got inspiration for this one from the Japanese Sakura Blossom. So, and this is also a metaphor, like, we, we play with many metaphors because I think the metaphors can help us to to focus on, on things, like to get clarity on what you should. And kaika is like in Japanese is like sakura has different phases of uh, of blossom. 
and kaika is when you are fully blossom so to reach that state of like you are f- in full blossom and yes that that's the that's that's the purpose of uh, like another one of those japanese words that we wanted to put out there awesome yeah and um okay so i'm going to keep us moving one last thing I want to ask you about in this section, I know I haven't asked you about the forest bathing. I haven't asked you about Ichigo Ichigai. Is that? Uh, yeah, Ichigo, Ichigo Ichigai. Ichigai. Uh, right. Yes. And then I understand you have Ikigai for teens coming out this year too, about the time this comes out. Ah, yes. We we wrote this. I don't know. How, well, we felt a little, we, we didn't plan after the release of Ikigai. We felt the response, this may be, See, this is where, for ourselves too, is like we felt the responsibility. Sometimes you have to, even if you want to have to do other things in life, you have the responsibility to do things. So we felt the responsibility that we have to write more about ikigai and they have like a philosophy around it. We have a second, which is called the ikigai journey. So this is going to be a little bit of sales, like like Ikigai, the original book. It's uh, published by Penguin. It has this. It's the one that that you have with the the blue cover, and it's where we set the basics. We we set the idea of how important it is Ikigai, and we go to Okinawa, to the where they live the longest in the world, and we interview all the old people in Okinawa, and we ask them about their Ikigai and what are the secrets of having a long and happy life, because that's a very important thing. You want to be only being healthy, you want to have a long life. And the problem with uh, the first book we got, and this is from American American culture, the rest of the world didn't have this problem, but from the US, one of the biggest feedbacks that we had is that in our first book, there is no actionable items, which this is a very... I'm going to say this is a very American thing. You need yeah. the actionable items. You were saying, like, what? How do I use it? What do I do with yes, it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm going to give you that. Like for that, we wrote this one, and a next book, which is called the Ikigai Journey, which is focused only on that, and that was published in the middle of like last year, and it's still yeah, it's it's available in the U.S. The Ikigai Journey, and it's 35. It's a is 35 ex- exercises to help you uh, navigate and try to discover your Ikigai. And it's organized also to make the, the book fun. Is every, every section is like a stage you are traveling with us around Japan. So it's like a trip around Japan. Uh, it has a little bit of like travel log. Like you feel like you're in, in Japan and you are developing your... It has 35 exercises and the last one is the one I described uh, before here. It's like you write down your ikigai, uh, your purpose in life. But uh, like, yeah, so that's... And now for ne- the, the next request was like, we need something for younger people, which I th- I feel like these days, also my generation, or maybe your ge- like from your generation, we are having, it seems like we are having like all this wealth and technology and everything is possible. But the contradiction is, and this is how I felt, and I think most of millennials and the next generation, I don't know how they're, the next generation of millennials we are feeling is, I think the common feeling is like we have all these possibilities and we have all this amazing education. And I think now most of the people like, you might have some struggles with money, but it's not the main. I think in the 70s and 80s, it was more like a struggle. It's like, okay, we have to think how to finish. So we have all these things, and I think we are lost in possibilities, and we get confused about life. It's like, and this is, in fact, how Ikigai starts, also with uh, uh, my my brother telling me, I don't know what to do with life. And I think that's uh, it resonates with many people. It's like, okay, yes, I've been doing all these things, but what do I do with my life? Which is very important question to make to yourself. 
And that's why we are focusing, we are publishing a book uh, in this year that is Ikigai for Teens, which has a language that is much easier to read for, I think even if you are 10 years old, you can read the book. And it brings you, it tells you the importance of having purpose in life, from which I think is something that I was never taught in school. Like it was, and I think it's, if you think about it, this is also, you said like, like Ikigai, I see the way we lay out, we also not the very, I think we have some original ideas, but most of our ideas are from the, the, the background of the Ikigai philosophy that we lay out in our books is very existentialism, basically. It's like, you can believe whatever, and I think that's why it resonates with any culture in the world. You can believe whatever you want. You can believe in any religion. You can believe like any gods. You can live in any culture. Whatever you want to believe, you can believe in many lives. Like Whatever you believe, that's okay. But we can all agree that we are all now, you you and me, we are all now alive in this time and place. And we are in planet Earth. And we were born in X time and we are going to die at Y time. And from X to Y, uh, we have a story where we can, sometimes we are, feel like we're being controlled like a puppet but at some other points we can take control and be happy so existentialism is like focusing on that fact that we can all agree what was before we were born and what will happen after we were dead like that i leave that to other people i like focusing on this uh, like existentialism we are here and that's where the ikigai philosophy is all all the bricks are together there. Like and the Ikigai for teens will be also focused on that, on on having, which I think is also your podcast title is on having a good life where we are like here. Yeah, this it, this was something no one had suggested to me either when I was that age. And I sometimes wish I could run like a parallel, like simultaneous reality and see if my life had followed that path. <laughs> How might it be different? Uh, you know, I like this. See, this is this is. I like this exercise, but you, usually, if you if you do that, you realize, and this is an interesting. That's that's an exercise that I like thinking. But if you do that, you wouldn't be. I think the end thought for me always is like, what if when I was this, I would have done this? But then you realize it is like these time machine movies, right? you realize that a little change or thing that you would talk, would have huge consequences in the future and then you would you wouldn't be the same person that you are today which i think i, I don't know if you are now in a like you should be like you and then you you feel like you could be a totally different person and that's okay to think about it and maybe the but i think the other exercise that is also very powerful, you can think about that, but you can think that I also believe that it's never... I love people who are there, they are in their 80s and they start a new hobby. So I think you you can do the same exercises now. It's like, okay, if Brilliant from like 20 years from now came today, what would Brilliant tell me? Yeah. Which yeah. is like... You're like, hey, dude, you should start doing this because that will accumulate, or you should stop doing this. Um, but yeah, I agree. I also have the same thoughts. It's like, and that because it's like, but if you have that idea since you were 15 years old, I think it can be very powerful for a person to. I don't think you ever waste time in your life because maybe. The years that were not that good, then they taught you a lesson. I, I like thinking like that. Yeah, I agree. I like that too. Let me transition our conversation to, let me shift gears to go to the enlightening lightning round. So if you're good with that, okay. a series, a variety of questions on uh, many different topics. The My aim on this is for the most part, just to ask the question and stand aside. 
but you're welcome to answer as long as you want. <laughs> okay? All right. So question number one, please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a... Like a long trip in a country or a place or a planet that we've never been. Okay. Question number two, what important truth do very few people agree with you on? I don't know. I think I tend to be a very agreeable... I tend to... I tend to be very accept, acceptical. I tend to. What would be a good example of this? That I'm very. Sometimes I very. I'm very stubborn with things that I really believe. I think one that sometimes people. I believe that every person, almost except in some areas, every person can become at least maybe not one of the top in the world, but you can become like one of the top. Five percent. If you put effort in almost anything, except some areas that in a sport, maybe if you and me we want to get uh, into running one hundred meters and become, maybe we will never. There is some genetic. There are some limitations for some areas in life, or if you want to become a surgeon, maybe you are not the right. But for ninety nine percent of things, if you really focus on something. If you want to become a musician, if you want to become an artist, if you want to become an engineer, I believe that because many people believe, no, I'm not good at math, and I think that most of the times is bad. Is I think that's those are fake beliefs put by others in our minds, and it's not true. So that's something. If you work on something, I believe you can become good at almost anything, any human being. I think so too. Okay, question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it, or a phrase, or a saying, or a quote, or a quip, what would the shirt say? Do it. Okay. <laughs> question number four. <laughs> what book, other than one of your own, have you gifted or recommended most often? I like Murakami Haruki a lot, a Japanese novelist. So... Probably it would be a Murakami Haruki novel, which I think I think we were saying before about philosophy. He's a philosopher without himself knowing it, and he also he's a novelist. But you can read his novels in many layers, and maybe I always recommend Murakami Haruki. You just just get one novel, you read it. If you don't like it, just forget about him. But if you like, I, there is. These two type of people in the world. People who like Murakami Haruki and you don't like it. <laughs> if you if you don't like it, that's okay. You can yeah. but if you like it, I can assure you that you will enjoy almost you you will have fun for years reading his novels. That's awesome. It I've only be, ever read one of his books and it wasn't a novel. It was his book. I think it's what I talk about when I talk running, about running. When you, when you when you're running. Yes. Yeah. I read that and I really liked it, but I never did read his fiction. I think okay. Then, then this is. I'm going to give you a to do. <laughs> okay, I'm like, ready. What is it? What? The, just get get any like get a Murakami Haruki novel. Okay. And don't don't get Norwegian Goods, which is the most popular, and I okay. think it's the most overrated. Get another one. I, I okay. think you will like Kafka on the Shore. Okay. I don't know what like Kafka on the Shore, and. I think if you've lived in Japan, it will give you some nostalgia thoughts. And Kafka on the Shore, it's a novel where I think he understands. I've read many books in Japanese of Murakami, where he, also nonfiction, uh, he thinks, it seems in the novels that he doesn't think very deeply, but he has friends who, who are like famous Japanese psychologists. He thinks very deeply deeply about the psyche human psyche and that you you can see it in his in his characters in his novels and in kafka on the shore the protagonist it seems like it's a very very innocent person that is moving through life like and things are happening to him and it's a very an amazing and you can think of it's almost you can think of, of each character of this as different. Sometimes there are different opposites of what you, the reader, 
psyche has like you have this tendency in your, in your personality and this one so i think murakami haruki's novels are very like they can bring emotions out of you like you can find even though they're totally surrealistic sometimes it has nothing to do i think for me it has like the power to bring out hidden emotions inside me in a very indirect way and mysterious way so that's why and if that works for you that if if doesn't work then you can just find another so yeah murakami haruki okay thank you for that Question number five. This one's about travel. You've traveled extensively. What's something you do when you travel or something you take with you to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? One book. I I bring a physical book. That's why because yeah, I got bored. I got bored of the Kindle. So now I put like a real book in the backpack and that go analog. Be, <laughs> and that becomes is a nice feeling because it feels like I have a partner in my, it's an extra partner for those idle times when you're traveling. You have the the book, the real, the physical book that is in your backpack. And if you want to drink water, you have to take the book out and then you start reading it. <laughs> so it be, it's very, I, I love having a book with me. Awesome. Number six, what's something you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? And maybe I should ask you this in a, in a few months after you turn 40. <laughs> ah, yes, I'm having this. I need your advice on this one. I don't, well, I don't know how old you are. Like you're, you're, I'm old enough I have to do the math now. I'm going to be 44 average. this year. Okay, then you should. I need your advice. I'm going <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think I went through. I haven't gone this. My, I, I had, in fact, to connect the story of how Ikigai was written. I wrote the book Ikigai when I was 32. Uh, suddenly I started feeling, I got, a, I call it a weird illness after I was basically, I couldn't do anything for one, two years. Until this is a physical the, illness? The, Maybe a mental? It's a in, intestine, intestine. Oh, intestinal, okay. But yeah, at the beginning they thought it was mental because they couldn't detect it. So it was a very, it's a long story, but I suffer. the point is that those two years, and it was more than until I was diagnosed, and the illness is called SIBO, and it was one type of SIBO that it was very... So I was in the worst in my life, yeah, 2014, something like that, and that's where... I met my co-author for Ikigai and I explained him. He came to Tokyo to see me. He was like becoming a friend and we were having a long walk and he he's a famous novelist in Spain and I explained him about the concept of Ikigai. In this long walk, he told me, we have to write a book together because it will help you to heal yourself. And I was like, well, I was... With all this, it's a, I have a real, it's an interesting illness. How is a book going to help me? And I would say it's, it has helped me like 10%. The doctors helped me another 10% and my life has started getting better. So the process of writing Ikigai, and I think that's one of the reasons why the book also resonates with many people, is because I wrote it from my heart. I wrote the book to help me. Like I was going through... Okay, I'm feeling bad every day, so my life has no, no meaning. I'm feeling pain, so it was very hard for me. So that I wrote it to help heal myself. And that's why that's why I did it. I wrote the uh, ikigai, and I forgot your question. It's, it was about was, what you've done, started or stopped uh, doing yes. to live or age well. And so I wrote I wrote ikigai to heal, and and then while writing ikigai. I had this phase, I remember writing down my purpose when I finished writing Ikigai, my purpose for 2016 or something like that. I like a fable. It's a Japanese fable that it's, uh, let me see how I, it's, uh, uh, you know, that there is the sensei that is the teacher and the, the people. And uh, there is these people who goes into the room with a tatami tatami room in a Japanese university, 
and ask the sensei uh, a question, how I can become better at this. The sensei says, first, you have to empty your cup because there is green tea until the top. So st stop filling the cup with more tea because you are spilling everything. So I like this story a lot because it's like, and I think this is so awesome. many people can relate. It's like, I'm doing 100% things in life, but people are asking me to do even more and more and have more goals and write my goals for next year. Now we are in January. Everyone is like, I should do this and this and whatever. And I remember writing my goal for 2016 is like empty the cup. That was empty the cup of green tea. And I started eliminating like, I was even radical. My friends and family were saying, Hector, you're stopping. I removed almost everything from my life. I quit my job. I I stopped doing many things. I even sold, you say, it was radical because my hobby was photography too. I sold all my cameras and all my lenses and everything. I went minimalistic too. There is this tendency, like, I went everything like to empty my cup to almost zero. And after that, I feel like I'm starting to fill the cup slowly, but more carefully. Like I'm I'm back to taking pictures with my phone. I'm back to to doing like to as we said at the beginning, I'm back to trying to explore other hobbies. Like I'm looking onto making video games, but I'm trying not to fill the cup like I feel stressed. It's like but yeah, I like the idea a lot of knowing yourself or knowing what to do by elimination. Start, if you're lost in the forest, start by cutting, cutting, cutting. I think sometimes you don't even realize until you cut something that how much space was that taking in your mind and, and energy. Sometimes it's like, oh no, I'm doing this, but it's just it's just two hours per week. Okay, yes, but those two hours you are dealing with a client that you're hating. And you the day before you're thinking about it and the day later you are pissed off because they said something. And that's totally different of I'm guessing that you enjoy doing this podcast. If you if you eliminate that two hour meeting and you replace it with a podcast that you those two hours you're having a blast. And after those two hours, you're thinking the next day, whoa, whoa, that was amazing. And then you're thinking, then the energy. So that's, I think, a lot about energy. Like, is this thinking adding energy to my life or is it sucking energy from my life? Yeah. That sounds very simple. Yeah. And then if it's sucking energy, sometimes it's like, there's another word in Japanese that is shogunai. It's like, you have to suck it. Like, okay, this maybe we're talking about the client it's a client that is taking 80 percent of your revenue mm -hmm. you have to suck it up but if it's 20 percent of your revenue then then get rid of that that client for example yeah. this word is sh shogunai <laughs> shogunai shogunai which i've been, I've been having requests of like oh this is it's, sh isn't, this, there's no, isn't that there's no way isn't that shogun? Uh, show his yes, way. I have a problem with that word because I think you can be very negative with that word too. It's like giving. It's like giving up. So, but sometimes you can use it as like you have to to, to embrace it, or accept. Uh, you have to accept it. It's like a very samurai. Like okay, my duty is to is my duty. Yeah. Which, this I can also say bad things about Japan, by the way. Yeah, yeah. well, that, that's everything, right? I mean, <laughs> but, there's the, the duality and the polarity uh, and everything. Yes. I wonder, I wonder if you if you write that book, if there's a if there's at least a little exploration to be made about the U.S. military's Navy SEALs term, embrace the suck. Yes, that might be the uh, that might be similar. They might that might be inspired by Japanese. <laughs> yeah, perhaps <laughs> the, war, the warrior culture. Yeah, yeah, the warrior. That's very warrior. Yeah, which for some things, for I think that's very good for in our normal lives. We are not warriors. That's good to use that mentality for that. You can use also that eat eat the frog the first thing in the morning. Yeah, I think that's good for 
like little things. And I think it's, and you should take it also as motivating. Okay, I did this thing. Yeah, it's okay. time. And then, but, but if you, if you, if you're in your warrior mindset, eight, 10 hours per day, that can be destroy you. Yeah, for sure. Okay, <laughs> okay. Question number seven What's one thing you wish every American knew? Without getting very political these days. <laughs> I think, but I think it's becoming already obvious and a wake up call. I think still, I don't, I, I don't want to offend anyone because I love America. I love every time I've been there. I don't. I know a lot California, and I love it. I at, at some point I was thinking about moving to to the U.S. to California. So yeah, I love I love the United States, and it's a very powerful. I think your culture has influenced me. I think since my childhood, even more. I would say. My brain and the person I am, I was born in Spain, but I've been watching Hollywood movies my whole life. I've been reading mostly, I've I've learned English by reading books in English. And so the person I am today is thanks to the United States, like culture. So one thing that I wish they would realize it is it's still very most i think not not everyone but most of the united states they still think that they are the center of the world and i think that's becoming obvious that and that for me became incredibly a shifting change when i came to live in japan because i realized how asia is becoming it already is i think but people in the us are not realizing the shift is 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 going to happen in the next ten years economically. The United States is still number one, and that's something I wish, like the United. And sometimes many, sometimes it feels like people from the United States assume that I know everything that is going. It's like, no, like I think that's a little bit arrogant sometimes. In no, in other countries, no one assumes like. If you go to Singapore, people explain you what's going on. No one assumes that you know who is the running Singapore. Or you go to Malaysia and people explain you. In the United States, you go there. But that's that's I should say that's also nice. I go to the United States and people assume after several days, they all already assume that I'm from one living there. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's also nice. So I'm going to but they already assume that I know everything that is going on. Like, so that's, and I, I would think that one thing that the United States has to keep to be, be aware of how important culture is, which that's becoming like how powerful, I think that's Hollywood. Like it, it seems a little bit, but it's very, very powerful. And I think that's what differentiates a Japan which economically now is less powerful than China and Korea. But Japanese culture, it's a very, very powerful thing. I don't know, powerful, I don't like the word, but it's very valuable in a culture. Now that the United States is becoming, I think it's becoming, it's, yeah, so that's, I don't know if you have thoughts there. You're talking about the Japanese culture, about the influence it has? about cultures in general and how important it is like and to keep, to keep that like oh, to yeah. keep like okay we is like and i think china is waking up in that aspect too they are starting to produce their own culture which they were not so good i think that was still an advantage from the united states before but now asia i i open my netflix now in japan and I'm starting to see it's starting to be filled with uh, Korean movies, Chinese movies, Indian movies. So uh, United States culture is disappearing for, from my Netflix. So Netflix is still an American company, but anyway, they're just that's, their algorithms getting smarter. That that's all. Yes, <laughs> it, yes, it is getting more like okay. They know I'm Japanese. Yeah, that that I have another problem with those algorithms. But. Oh yeah, yeah, that's its old <laughs> old whole their subject, isn't it? Okay, the last questions here. Number eight. What's the most important or useful thing 
you've ever learned about making relationships work? Okay, three things come to mind. One is like, like, don't you have to to make a relationship work? You have to always there is a balance. You cannot be like hundred percent. There is sometimes you have to give up. Like, okay, this I don't know if it's a like win or okay, okay, like you can get away with this one, and I will get away with this one. So if it's like. Uh, Two persons who are like 100% alpha, it will not work. And like you have to give and take. The second is like if it has to work over time, be aware that you have to keep making more or less the same effort 10 years in than the first two weeks. Because the first two weeks or the first two months is like so exciting. It's like when you find new friends, when you move to a new country, it's like, whoa, and you're meeting every week. But when you're five years in, then maybe you are not even meeting. So having a consistency like every week. And for this, I have the example of, do we, we talk in ik Ikigai when we went to the people of the longest living people in the world. It's a little village with 2,800 people and all of them, so they don't feel lonely because the, one of the problems, is, of course, is like they, they live long, but that's also a problem, of course. It's not like, it's like, it's not like paradise. They have to, but one of the things that he helped them is that they feel, no one feels lonely because they all belong to something called Moai. And Moai is a word to define. It's just a group of people that they have uh, those 2,800 people. We saw the book in the city hall where it's all cataloged and every Moai has a title. And they have to meet, they have a meeting every week where they can, each Moai has like one hobby. They can drink tea or they can uh, sing karaoke. We joined some of them. That's so awesome. And it felt very nice because there was a consistency. You know that whatever it happens in your life, because you are the elders, it's like maybe your grandchild moved to Tokyo and you're feeling lonely. You know that your Moai is going to be there. Yeah. So, and, and so the Moai is like a social club with a purpose or a focus. Right? Yes. And also, yeah, yes. So, and it's being used. I, I learned that in Los Angeles, Many people read Ikigai and they're making moais in Los Angeles. That's so great. City. So, yeah, you have a purpose. And if you want to make it even more, you can have a, like a bucket of, it can be very simple. You put $50 every month and that's a common money. And the money can be used sometimes to have fun. But some other times it can be, in the case of Okinawa, if a typhoon comes, and your house is broken, uh, people can use the the money from the Moai to help. So it's a very, it's a little bit communist. So it's like everyone, so that also feels nice. So yeah, that's like give and take, have a consistency over time. And the third one that is, I think I fail a lot. I'm very bad at this one. So that's why I'm going to say it. Is like realize that sometimes some, sometimes no it's like you have to take if you want your friends to get together and do something together or if you want uh, to have fun with your wife or your husband it has to be you who takes the initiative and say okay I've prepared this plan for this trip and it's going to be this month uh, let's do it and you organize everything or let's get together this weekend to I don't know play golf or play soccer and let's do it i i found this place so taking the lead i would say because sometimes if we all assume that someone else is going to take the lead then nothing nothing happens and we've all seen this like when the person who is the organizer in the group disappears then like things get weird like, yeah so. <laughs> or it just this just like collapses and dissipates or, so, or something fragments which that's also i think that's also okay i think there is i also another the fourth one is like don't force things like people 
like sometimes you can get a little bit sad something i've been learning now that you know maybe more than me like older like people who like friends and family they will come and go more to your life depending on where you are and what they are and the ones who have to come back they will come back to you somehow and so just be aware of that um, just yeah um, like the natural the natural flow yes yeah i love that and and just to go back briefly to one point on the moai something i would just offer it's interesting to me to feel the difference between the word communist and communal okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> really, okay communal i like that yeah. more i think it's interesting because especially in the united states there's probably a charge to communist but communal somehow seems oh this is lovely <laughs> you know okay yeah let's change it communal so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. okay wonderful all right final question here in the enlightening lightning round which is about money aside from compound interest what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money or what's something you're always sure to do with it or you never do with it okay another hard question <laughs> Well, good news is this is the last one in things the lightning lightning round. about money. So I think, well, let's divide off things. Let's make a list like before. Okay. And number one is that money, it's something, something that they learn is that we have a me, an image of what money is. And the fact that I'm going to use a bad, like fucked up thing about it <laughs> is that it can, it can really mess. It's a, one of the most powerful things out there that can mess with human emotions is like is like kind of sometimes when I see it and in myself and in others it's kind of crazy like how how many how it triggers your emotions. I'm going to give you an example. It's like maybe maybe you have I don't know like you are twenty like no it's an example. Really. You have an very good amount of money in your bank. Uh, you are you have I don't know very big amount of money, but one day something happens and you lose a hundred dollars because something happened with you. You sent an invoice in a weird way, and they took a commission that wasn't fair, and they take those hundred dollars, and then the rest of the day you are pissed off because of those fucking hundred dollars. Right. Right. That that happens, or you you that and and I don't blame that person because that happens to me too. It's like even with like very small, and when it's the reverse, we are very happy. It's like oh look, I made and Japanese comp by the way. I don't know in the US, Japan is getting very weird with this. We get po you you live here, you get points with everything, right? And I think they know how to play with your emotions. It's like. I go to the convenience store. I uh, know this they give me 10 more points with this one and it's is these points if you think in money at the end it's like I don't know some cents Six it's totally cents or something. It's, to it's totally stupid. Right. And then I'm going to philosophize even more. This is being brought to video games to which I I like I have also my opinion on video games. I like classical video games. This trend of video games that are being made like slot machines. Oh yeah, like the loot boxes and I think that's like that's bad for our brain. That's playing with the same like emotional the trick. Yes, the addictive, like I give you this, but then I remove this from you. And when this these are the there are studies that you are much more unhappy if someone if someone takes like ten dollars from you, sometimes you prefer you like I, f I forgot the experiments but it's like we feel much worse if someone takes some someone from us that if we get like maybe a hundred dollars sometimes you prefer okay i'm i prefer not losing and that also if you start investing i've done my you know like as a hobby like investing in the markets and that thing is very difficult to control like because you don't want to lose this, then you start doing stupid things like you keep, uh, there is this word like you keep holding that stock or something and then and then it starts going down and you start having this. So yeah, like you can apply this 
emotions and be, and be very aware that sometimes you feel i think in my 20s i felt like oh, okay i'm i'm smarter than everyone uh, this uh, money is not but then you start realizing how it's affecting you in like from the decisions you are making to buy a house to buy small things in the supermarket to how you are investing and how you are playing video games that they give you rewards it's all the same systems so that's something being aware of those things i think is very important for for your i think it's not it's not about having more or less money it's about being being equally emotionally healthy with a thousand dollars in the bank account and a hundred thousand dollars it's just it's just a number in there and i think in my case i've been I can say when I arrived to Japan. In fact, I I had I arrived to Japan with uh, two hundred dollars and uh, twenty kilograms luggage, and I think reflecting, I was more excited and happier at that time. That I don't know how you can measure happiness, but I was probably super. I was not worried at all. The thing is, like my worries about money were zero, which if I think about it now. That I'm more like if now you tell me if someone tells me Hector all the money in your bank account and you, everything is going to disappear you will have only two hundred dollars and you have to start a new life in this I don't know in Hawaii I would totally freak out <laughs> now but and, and then you would by, adjust yes eventually but, <laughs> but this is this is the weird but when I was when I was twenty two. For some reason, I was so confident, or I didn't have this. And I think now the actor of now is different. Maybe is because I put I don't know what it is. Maybe you have thoughts on this. So my my conclusion is that it's a very powerful thing that can change how we feel and how we act in life. And it's. Uh, you have to realize that those, that's so true for you and for the people around you. And you just have to navigate that and, and and be aware of that. It's like, it's not like, yeah, so. I like that. And and I've heard it said, you know, there's obviously there's so many ways to think about and talk about money. But this idea that money really, money just makes us more of who we really are, right? Which is maybe a little off the the point that you were making. But I have this theory that that money is something that we've invented, maybe like our unconscious selves or our higher selves, to help us see more clearly who we really are, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Like, how do we choose to respond when certain things occur? And now we've created this agreement, you know, money. Okay, it's a, it's a tool to navigate. Yeah, and the yes. same, you know, which is totally off. I, I think I'll save. I have another theory that we've we've essentially done the same thing with technology. That you know we create these technologies that allow us to do things like travel great distances in a short time, store and recall large amounts of information, um, to know what's happening in a remote part of the world or even you know other parts of the galaxy that are perhaps abilities we already have within us. But we're externalizing our ability in the form of technology to see that we can do it. And perhaps at some point, we'll learn we don't need the technology to do it. Mm, yes. Uh, and it's a, it's a, and it's a feedback, feedback loop. That, yeah. Like it's, it's, uh, we are making it. And then that thing is kind of showing us, helping us, see. helping us. And sometimes is controlling us in weird ways. So we have to, it's this feedback loop that can be, beneficial but it can be also detrimental it can make it, it can be detrimental yeah so that's where yeah that, awareness that's a similar to money it's like an external thing that it's a yeah money is a technology in fact it's something right. that Just humans that, like has, language or mathematics or music it's a, it's a technology that it's out there made by human beings and that's it's a tool and it can be used it can be detrimental or as you said, it's like it makes it makes more of who you are, or yeah, makes or, or perhaps just exposes what's there, helps us become more aware, and so forth. And also realize like something more. Also realizing that the most important thing 
to have self-confidence that going back to the example, imagine like an exercise is like you have to start your life now from from zero, like zero, zero dollars and everything. Realize that the most when you start doing this exercise, you start realizing how important it is to have good skills and be able to do things. If you don't know to do anything, then you are in a hard place. And if you know how to do things, then you can start. And some people will argue, and I think that's also true, like being very well connected is very, very important to leverage. But these days with the internet, if you have the skills, you can slowly, you can start like yeah, make making the money. And if you're very well connected, then of course, like, the leverage then you can start much faster like with call which i think that's true that's a reality i've seen it in japan and spain in very different different cultures but being very very being well connected it's always it opens weird doors in your life which that's a, another thing like being well connected is something that you can also I see it as you can start. I I don't like the the word networking, but it's used a lot these days. I like more like building relationships that built on each other, and I believe in long term. Like it's like I don't expect someone to open me the door, but maybe ten years from now this happens, and then you get this call, and then serendipity. I like serendipity. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I love that. And then and then something else you write about, about synchronicity. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept. Well, Hector, we're just about at the end of our time. Just a few last questions. The first question is, when did you first realize or maybe admit or acknowledge, when did you first realize you were a writer? It was a slow process, but for me, it was about observation. I studied in university. I studied computer science and, and software. Basically, in Spain, it's called computer science, and it's a mix of computer science and software engineering. Yeah, you can imagine that's all very nerdy computers and a very you have to learn very logical minds, right? But I noticed that I had this tendency, different from other people who were studying with me, which I would write down very long explanations to try to explain things and that got me an advantage in certain sub how do you say in certain exams that were more about writing i was better at that and i was also better at presenting and telling stories the third year in university i created a website and i started writing in the website and basically that become that was an area that was that i was becoming it was starting to be, I changed the, instead of a website, okay, now it's a blog. It was the beginning of blogs. So, and suddenly it became a popular blog in Spain. It's like a small community, so it's not that difficult to be. And that blog, the first day, in fact, you can, that blog, the first day I arrived to Japan, I kept writing in that blog. So at the beginning, it was thoughts about engineering and reading books. I was already so from the first day I landed in Japan I, I I kept writing in that blog and it became even more popular in Spain because on those times there was no YouTube no no nothing no social network so it was the first time that I think people in Spain could see Japan outside of movies like you have this image I think the internet is changing the image of countries because now you can see things more in the 90s, at least for me, when I came to Japan, I had no idea how this place looked like. I just watched Kurosawa movies, and and that's totally different how from how Japan is now. So I was writing and writing and writing, and after two years of writing like openly in my blog, which this, by the way, this is another website I have. Before you shared HectorGarcia.org, that's a very generic I have a blog called agikinjapan.com, which I is still alive and it has like like more than ten years of content. And 
after three, four years of writing, I did something that I copy pasted everything into a Word document and I saved it as a PDF and I called it uh, Japan. I think I called it Japan Culture Book, which is a very bad title, but that's that was the beginning. That was that was the beginning of me being a writer, <laughs> but I still had. This is another thing, like our identities. I didn't believe I was a, I was a writer. In fact, even now, I'm starting to believe it now after many, many years. In my after mind, you finally getting royalty checks. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's a weird thing. It goes back to money if you're not making, because I was making money with my software engineer. So uh, in my mind, I'm a software engineer. I'm not a writer. And I recommend something I do now in my diary, in fact, in my, I try to use, instead of writing goals for myself, I write my identity. I like a lot this new trend in self-help that you write your identity. I, I am I am a writer and you write it down and that helps you to start believing it. So if you want to become a chef, you, you say, I am a chef and you start embracing that even at home when you're cooking you're a chef so you have to so i'm a writer so when i sit down i have to write and that pdf going back to the story is like that pdf i sent to more than 50 publishers in in spain no one answered except one and that one i'm very grateful for that they say yes because that that's that's the one that opened the doors like it's a very closed industry at the end of the day and so and i was not i was extremely badly connected i was not i was but this sending cold emails it's a very underestimated technique and you don't need i got rejected like yeah more than like 50 times almost but only one who opens the door then that, that that's enough you don't have to care you don't have to get depressed about the other ones let me just jump in right there and ask what how did you persist in the face of that rejection what kept you going i so for for me that that was a very i have vague vague memories i sent all the email when i do these things in fact i'm very bad with this i'm not a good person with uh like doing cold, I could never do a say. I admire people who can do cold calls. I cannot really very. <laughs> like, so for me, it's like I make a list of emails, I write a template, and I send all of them the same day. And and then whatever it happens. And most of the time, it's not even a re- rejection. It's like it's just uh, no response. It, it, yes, it's just no response. So it's like whatever. So I do that with everything. And that first book, it was called A Geek in Japan and was later published in English. And it's still one of the, I think now it's a classic of, I think I would recommend the Ikigai book. It's very nice if you are like want to think about purpose in life. A Geek in Japan is still, I think it's one of the top selling books about Japanese culture in general. And it's very popular now because it has pictures that I took. And it's like traveling. It's not a guide of Japan. It's, it feels like you're traveling around Japan with me. So uh, it's a more intimate book. It was published in English. And I have another story about rejection. In the US, My the English publisher, they asked me to get in the US. Everyone wants... Uh, by the way, I will ask you in the future this. No, I'm having, you, you have to write the blurbs. Uh, someone important or famous. Uh, you need that sentence. Like uh, this famous person read it. And for me, that was that was like, okay, I got blocked. Like uh, the publisher is asking me this. Like I know no one in the US. It's like totally, I'm, I'm a, it's my first book. No one knows me in the U.S. Who do I ask? And I, and I approached the problem in the same way. I made a list of emails 
and I didn't know many people who were famous in the US, but I started with what I know, which for me was computers and software and everything. And I I I did something, I started sending emails to even so it was it is maybe people will laugh, but it was Bill Gates at Microsoft.com and things like that. It was a list like that. That people I are I admired. And of course, no one replied except uh, everyone will know at that time in the U.S. and I think now Larry Ellison replied me, like which was like with very short email. It was I want to read your book, and I researched Larry Ellison. He loves Japan, so I tried to target like I tried to yes. Yeah, so he loves Japan and he has a Japanese house he has made. So I think that's the reason he answered. He answered personally without usually you get an answer from a, how do you say like, like a gatekeeper or an assistant. But it was Larry. I, th- I thought that was very cool. So yeah. the rest was nothing, and he answered. And then he in fact he read the book and he wrote he he wrote a very short blurb which is now in the back cover of a geek in Japan. And I think that made. That made it, and it was, and I forgot about all the others that rejected me. That is awesome. And another story, I did the same for Ikigai. I think for that one it went better because already people knew us. Mm-hmm. But I did for some people. I I sent the book, for example, to Neil Gaiman, and I never got an answer. But then, one day, I think it was Amanda Palmer. Is uh, Neil Gaiman's partner uh, posted a picture on Instagram with many books in a shelf, and Ikigai was there. So that, wow. that was that was good enough for me. That's awesome. <laughs> so, That's so, so great. So so you never you never know. Yeah, that is so awesome. Well, thank thank you for sharing that. So I want to be sensitive to I want to, I want to be considerate of everyone, including Dallin, because I know in his time zone it's even later. <laughs> And we don't normally record in the evenings like this. And we've gone a little over. I do have two last questions. And one of them might might be a bit of a long answer. Or maybe not. You can tell me if you think it's worth answering. Because the two last questions I have. One is if you would if you'd be willing to lay out for me your process of writing a book. What it looks like now from whatever. Research, outline, drafting editing like if there's a if there's a somewhat succinct way of sharing that that's one question and then the last question is just advice or encouragement you have for anyone listening who wants to finish their own book so i think for the, there they say that there are these different personalities when it comes to writing uh, the people uh, as you said there are these keywords people this is used more for novels like there is the i think there is this word that you're the I forgot the uh, you are the panzer, and then there's another one. Like you plan everything from be, be, beforehand, like a, like a you're, planner. You're saying, yeah, planner, or you're figuring out uh, things along the way. And I'm more. I, I think I think most of the people we are hybrids. I'm a hybrid. I freak out a lot if I have to plan everything until the end, because then all the fun is is. I don't have fun in the process. I like playing more with throwing out. In fact, at the beginning is I have a folder. So to give very concrete, I have a folder. I have a folder in my computer that it's uh, it's called. In fact, I feel a little bit like yeah. The 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 folder is called Proto Ideas. So it's like promit like Proto is like it's ideas, and I have. I have tons of files there mm-hmm. that could potentially become a book, mm-hmm. but if they don't, I don't call it a failure. So it's a very low, it helps because if you start just, okay, I'm going to write this book and you get stuck and then you stop, then you feel like a failure. Right. So, But if you call it a proto idea. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. It can get lost and forgotten. Yeah. And usually what happens is that most of the thing in that folders are there and it just stays in my subconscious and maybe one day I go back and I write like one more page in that file 
maybe not. And at some point, I decide, and this that some point comes randomly in life. Maybe I'm having a long walk in a forest or in a Japanese temple. Maybe I'm taking a shower. I was like, okay, I have to do this. And then, then that the folder of that book that is a proto idea moves to, I call it ongoing books. And then there I try to organize a little bit, like a very simple draft of an outline. This is how I'm going to lay out, lay out the, but for me it's more the day I do that, I try to write the first 10, 20 pages of the book. So I get a tone of what I want to achieve. And the research process is very chaotic for me. I go by I go by feelings and curiosity and maybe I get into so one I get I get into a theme and I start reading many books about the theme. Yeah, that's and to finish a so that's that's a very important thing to finish to finish a book that's a very difficult. <laughs> Going back to the story before, like I sent this PDF to the publisher and the Spanish publisher said yes. And the PDF, I thought it was almost, I was very naive. I was, from there, it took me two years to finish. So the whole process, it was very long because there is lots of details and organizing the experience of the reader has to feel like one consistent book. That's something that I think is difficult to achieve. And you can count, you can do all tricks to to trick yourself into, you can count words and keep a word count. And when you are above like 40,000, 50,000 words, then you have a book. But you also need like a conclusion of what was all this book about. And so you need to write it down. So that's the process and the daily thing for me, I, I use the routine of, I try to break down, like when I start writing and when I finish, I I always brew the same, I, I have a green tea, Japanese green tea that I, I like. So when when I start having this green tea, I know that I have to write no matter what. And that's, and when I finish the green tea, then I can, and that's that's writing. You have to differentiate a lot between writing and editing. For me, it's a very different brain. When I'm in writing mode, I try not to judge myself or to overthink things. If something crazy is coming to my mind, I just write it down. Even if it's not true, I don't stop to do research. Is this true or not? I will just, okay, this is what I think. I will write it down. And then for me, editing comes up more in the afternoons. I'm a morning person with this. So you have to find when your brain is more in writing mode and editing mode, which is very... Some people like you start writing at night and then and you edit in the morning. So you have to find what works best, best with you. Okay, so you talked about this, um, the green tea and so forth. And... Uh... What I didn't hear you say in, in your answer yet is about where your co-author or your co-writer or your writing partner or collaborator, or how do you, what word do you use for Fransek? How do you describe uh, it? You use what we are using now because he lives in Barcelona. So the way we work is everything started, as I told you, in this walk that we were having in Japan and uh, I explained to him everything about Ikigai and he said, okay, let's write together. So we, he likes coming, he's this type of person who likes his hobbies coming to Japan once in a while, once, I think once every year he comes to Japan. And every time he comes, we do like a writing trip, like uh, somewhere. We choose a place to get inspiration and we have a purpose in mind. We have to write this book like uh, the ones you said before, Ichigo Ichie and Forest Bathing. So for each book, we go to a place to get inspired. But usually what happens is that we don't write that much. We're enjoying the trip so much that we just have notes about inspiration. And then we, when he goes back to Spain, then we connect uh, once per week uh, to do 
what we do together is not the writing itself, but we do editing. So his part, and, and usually it's 50-50. We do the editing together, so it becomes unif. It's very, I think this, I should say that I'm proud. I don't know if there is an example around the world. It. I don't know what do you think, but our books are starting to feel like are written by one person. Yeah, I, I think Which, so. Uh, and and I, I realize, I'm sorry, sorry to, to jump in, but I, I do have that sense that it is a single voice. And I realize is, many readers might not even notice that, but many books that are co-authored will actually say like, I, and then in parentheses, it'll say, which of the authors, right? But yours is just we throughout, and it sounds seamless. Yes, yeah, so I was saying, I, I think it's one of the things that we're, I think we're, I have this imposter syndrome many times, but I think we are really good at that. We've come, like, it becomes, it's a unified, uh, we, we have become very good at that. And going back to what you said about good relationships, we've been very careful of keeping this, like, weekly routine and crafting. We are not afraid of deleting each other's it becomes a very unified voice. In fact, it has be become so unified that I'm going to give you an exclusive. We have created a persona that we, we are going to launch a new book this year that is going to be the author name in the cover is going to be called Nobuo Suzuki. It will be a book written by us. It's not secret, but we, we, we want to create like a only the really real fans will know that it's us. But as you said, a normal person will read Nobuo Suzuki and they will think it's a Japanese author. Yeah. But but it's not. And we are That's not so pretending funny. we are not pretending to be fake, but but we're trying to have even a more unified because it allows it's a struggle always because we cannot talk in first person in our books. So having this we're becoming Nobuo Suzuki. So you'll be able so, to speak in so, first person. Yes. So, <laughs> That's so great. Is it nonfiction? Uh, yes, it will be. There, there is, I, we created even a website. It's nobuosuzuki.com. And the first book will be called uh, Wabi Sabi. And it will be a book about, yeah, about Wabi Sabi, which is also another theme that we are. But yeah, basically having very good communication and if you want to write with someone else, you have to be your ego. Something I realize our egos are very, no, none of us are very, we, we don't care about. I think that's also one of the reasons we have this Nobuo Suzuki. It's, it's going to be our alter ego from now on. It's like, we don't care that much. I don't want to become, be famous myself. I want my words to resonate in the world. So I think being famous. That's beautiful. What are the characters? What's the meaning of the characters in this Nobuo Suzuki? What is it? What does it mean? Uh, nothing. I just chose something that is easy. I don't know if it will be easy to remember. It's easy to remember for for people. And I also checked that there is no no other author that is called like this. So we are not trying to compete with. And the idea is to be to give us also more creative freedom because we can have a uh, Nobuo Suzuki has a uh, we we are adding a little some touches of uh, fiction like it has a uh, but all that we have a rule that we we should not lie so Nobuo Suzuki has a cat my my friend Frances has a cat so it's real we add, we try to add <laughs> things yeah. Nobuo Suzuki plays the piano and Francesc is a very good he he composes his own music and he publishes CDs in Spain so we're trying to bring things from our life but we can write in first person that's awesome that, that's, the... that's so unique well thank you for sharing that okay final question what advice or encouragement do you leave people listening with especially those who are engaged in their own creative endeavor and maybe especially if they are writing a book or if they want to write a book. I'm going to go back to the question you said before about my T-shirt. The, the answer is uh, do it, which it sounds very simple, but 
even me, I need the reminder daily. That's why I need the, the t-shirt, baby. <laughs> yes. If you, like, for example, for writing, for me, it's very, I could keep talking about this. It's very easy to break down. If, if you realize that a book, a book is, for example, the, the book Ikigai has 30, is not that long. It's 34,000 words, which are very, it's, but each word, we made sure that each word, the, the first manuscript, but was much longer, but, then we make sure that each word is is meaningful for the reader. But if you realize, if you break down, for example, 30,000 words, if you write down 500 words, so the, the message of do it, you sit down, you write 500 words every day, in, in 100 days, you have 50,000 words, which 100 days is a little bit more than three months. So... You basically have a book there in three months. And 500 words is probably what you're writing in text messages and emails every day. So it's not like you cannot do it. It's just you, you are not doing it. And, and not only you, but also me. It's like this, sometimes we are blocked. And to stop that blocking, there are all these techniques. If you are blocked, for example, one thing you can do is to use... Even if you're not a morning person, try to try to use in the when you wake up in the morning, you, your mind is the weakest in the day. So you can you can start doing something without really wanting to if you trick yourself into doing it. So what I mean is you, you just wake up, you you maybe you spend like one, two minutes preparing a coffee, but then you sit down in a table and you can even use a pen and a paper and you start writing. And this is this is a technique by I forgot her name is called the she's very famous in the U.S. The Morning Pages. Uh, yes, so I love that technique. It stops all your, and then you you start writing, and it can be the first two lines can be, I don't know what to write. Ah, I haven't woke up. Oh, this coffee smells good. Oh, maybe today. And then and then ideas start coming out. Oh, but I have to write about my book. And in the, in the first chapter, I'm thinking about this and maybe, and suddenly after five, 10 minutes, you're writing contents of your book. And then you can get those pages and type them down in your, I'm giving you ideas there. Like there are all these techniques too, but the main one is do it. And you can apply that to any creative, any creative thing and realize that another realization is to realize if you feel like when you see someone else that is much more, you can call it successful or wh whatever you want, you can feel overwhelmed. You're like, I will need 20 years. Realize that that person was also at some point a kid and didn't even know how to write down a word or read a book. And I use that example with Picasso. Picasso, when he was a kid, there was the first moment that he took a pencil and he drew his first line and he was not Picasso. He was not Picasso yet, but he just did it probably every most of the days of his life. So just realize that maybe you, if you are at the beginning, is you don't need to be perfect. You can be totally imperfect and that's okay. And even if you've been doing something 20 years, you can be imperfect. In fact, maybe you will not publish the video. I'm noticing that to I have this book just to hold my microphone <laughs> which is William's listeners I, on writing well on writing because I believe I try not to I, I also like another Japanese concept that that is keeping a beginner's mind is very important so don't get into that I don't get into thinking I use this for my photography and also for my writing don't get into thinking that I'm a good writer or a good photographer and go back to the very basics because maybe you can start forgetting them because you you are you are so deep into the forest. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, and then my curiosity, I just wonder when you write with Francesc, do you draft in Spanish and then translate or are you writing in English or something else? Always Spanish, Spanish. Always in we Spanish. Are not 
and th then we have a professional we have people who write translate to all languages yeah. which is its own I, art yes i think what i've tried i can i think i'm reaching a point with cc talking about imperfection i think i'm reaching a point that i have the confidence that i can write a book in english but i would need a very good editor to to polish because you can you can feel that all the grammar and everything will feel very like okay this is a little bit weird because that's how the sentence is structured in in spanish my brain works in spanish right on okay if people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you of course they can buy one of your books and i hope they do i hope they buy many of your books hopefully also at their local bookseller but if not there maybe on amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com or someone online they can visit you at hectorgarcia.org they can find you on instagram anything else any other thing you'd have people do yeah th those are the basics from there from the website you can find the twitter too awesome and, and yeah lately i use instagram a lot to cool. put beautiful pictures of uh, japan yes and as a thank you uh, for sharing your knowledge and your experience with me and everyone listening i've gone on the micro lending site kiva.org and I've made a $100 microloan to a woman entrepreneur in Kenya. Uh, her name is Teresa. She's 60 years old and she farms. So she'll use this to buy seeds and fertilizer to grow corn. And she'll sell that to improve the quality of life for her, her family and her community. So thank you for giving me a reason to, to do that. Thank you. I, I, use, I use Kiva too. Oh, that's so great. Then, yes. That's beautiful. I, I, like, I like that. Well... Hector, thank you so much for sharing so generously of your time and your knowledge and your experience and your insight. I have really enjoyed reading your books and talking with you today, and I'm really looking forward to sharing this with my friends. Thank you for having me. It was an honor to be here. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly at brian at brianmiller.com or by visiting goodliving.com. 